Then our next speaker is going to be Christian Bennett, who is the sales lead engineer of Cycor. And he's going to be talking about from product to purpose, from utility to, use, to usefulness. Ladies and gentlemen, Christian Bennett. Hello and welcome. Okay, thanks. Okay. How are you? Good, thanks. All yours. Thank you. Clicker. Clicker there. Hi, everybody. Thanks for... Uh, allowing me some time to talk to you. And uh, Nusha, that was a really great and interesting talk you guys had because it, it really aligns very well with some of the points that I want to make here. So you should take a second just to think about how do you want to be remembered? So in 10 years from now, how does your brand, how does that look? How does that look in the eyes of your consumers and of your customers? both you, your brand, and yourself. Basically, we want to talk about now how you make your brand become part of the inner circle with your customers and consumers. So over time, you know that brands that are in the uh, Fortune 500, the life expectancy previously was up to 75 years. It is rapidly declining and is now down to 15. But the brands that, that are on top here, you, you might know them. I can still remember most of them, but in very few years, there will be people here that never have heard about Kodak. They never know about who actually started to invent films, cameras, and stuff like that. But they're gone now, whereas the one on the bottom are still here. And the one on the bottom is still here for a very specific reason, and the ones on the top is gone for a very specific reason. The ones on the top are gone because they had a singular focus on only concentrating on product and price and not concentrating on having a purpose and having a purpose which means that their consumers can much better relate to them have a meaningful relationship with their brand and that the brand understands their customers and clients and that they are actually able to support them on and in that relationship and in their journey so if we're to take that a bit further then we need to define what is the inner circle and how do we actually get to that. So Aristotle, 2,400 years ago, defined or said that any person wants to be friends with another person for three specific reasons. Very simply, it's someone being useful, pleasant, and good. For any of those three reasons, you can easily build a relationship, you want to have a relationship with those types of, 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 of uh, people. That inner circle is a very uh, exclusive place to be, both in terms of human relationships, but indeed also in terms of brand relationships between consumers and brands. The average person has maybe a handful of people in that inner circle. The same goes for brands. Any person or consumer have give or take three to six brands in that inner circle where they truly engage with the brand and where they truly allow that brand to step into their innermost circle. So if we're to do the same that we did for friendships, we're not do for, for brands, we can say that if a brand wants to be in that inner circle, you have to understand your consumers, you have to surprise and delight, and you have to be useful and have purpose for that specific consumer. So... <clears throat> If we're to go dig even further into that, we need to define those three things a bit more. So <clears throat> understand, if we go back 15 to 20 years, sports goods manufacturers producing running shoes or sneaks or trainers, they would basically just produce a new pair of shoes, put them on the market, sell them until their stock were, I don't know, two-thirds away, and then deduct the price and get the, the last of them out the door without really understanding how they were used, for what they were used, or trying to support their users of those shoes, for instance. I myself is a keen runner. I do ultra marathons. So I'm very much looking into the brands that I am using when I'm doing my sport because I am looking for the brands that understand me. They need to understand why I'm doing what I'm doing, what my goal is. And I want to associate myself with brands that can help. Because if I'm going to go running for 60 kilometers in the desert, I need help. I need a pair of shoes, but I definitely need help to understand how my body works during that, during that race as well. 
So it's about them trying to understand which kind of consumer they're now interacting with. By doing that, they're definitely moving much closer to that inner circle. Furthermore, we can talk about the ability to surprise and delight. Surprise and delight has been sort of moving more and more into the center of marketing over the past decade. Surprise and delight is about surprising and delighting your customers when they do not necessarily expect you to do so. They expect, or let's say in a different way, surprise and delight has also not just to be to the clients that don't expect it, but you also have to do it across channels, across all the different channels that you interact with. Those can be digital, physical, offline, online. You just continue to name them. This is really, really difficult because this requires the marketeers that are working with us to figure out the needs of the specific individual at a given point in time and make sure that they understand their needs in that particular moment without becoming creepy. There was another presenter on stage earlier talking about the difference between cool and creepy. This is very much about focusing on the consumer and not on the company. So if you concentrate on the consumer and on their needs, there is a much bigger likelihood that you will never become creepy because the consumers will understand your interest in them from a pure, um, basically from a, from a pure interest point of view. Companies that have been doing this, for instance, is MasterCard, Priceless uh, Surprises, I think they were called. It was an ongoing initiative for years where they basically surprised clients that had posted about MasterCard experiences online. It could be meeting, uh, there was a, a, a one time where uh, a famous artist met fans and they basically gave away movie tickets and theater tickets and stuff like that. Another one that I really like is Kleenex, you know, the ones that make tissues. Um, they have become such an integrated part of our day-to-day -day communication. So we're not asking for a tissue, we're asking for a Kleenex. And they started monitoring social networks for people posting about them being ill. And when they found them, the, um, the goal for them was to within two hours, they were to deliver a box of goodies Kleenexes and stuff like that to make them feel good. 100% of the receivers came back on those social network posting about their experiences. Again, they surprised and delighted without the person that actually posted about being ill. They had never expected to get a, a greeting from, uh, from Kleenex. So the last part is about being useful and have a purpose. Brands that have a purpose, they are, say, much more sexier. But we want to interact with brands that have purpose. Why is a company like Apple again and again capable of selling a cell phone that is twice as expensive as a Samsung phone, for instance? Um, that is because they have a very, very clear purpose. They want to solve something for us as consumers. So we need to figure out as a brand who are we and what do we want to stand for. So if you take those three things together, we have the opportunity to move very close into that inner circle of, of, uh, of the consumers. So finding our way into this inner circle could also be, I travel a lot. I don't live in the region. I live in Denmark and Copenhagen, so I travel all over EMEA and I do business and my day, daily work takes me basically all over Europe, into the Middle East, into Africa. So I spend quite a lot of time in a plane and my experience from basically all the airliners that I use is not very positive. The only way that they communicate to me normally is because now I have to check into their flight so I can get my boarding pass, which is cool. I like that. That allows me to get onto the plane, but they just have so much more opportunity, right? They know where I am, when I'm going, and they know for how long I'm staying. If they really wanted to, they could also easily find out which hotel I was in. They could use the GPSs of the phones to figure out, okay, now that I get up in my home, I need to go to Copenhagen Airport. They could tell me ahead of time, you have to get up a half an hour earlier tomorrow because we know that there are, there are construction work going on on the highway. We know that you're going at uh, 7.30, which is normally a time with uh, traffic congestions. They can get all that data. So they have an opportunity to give me much more than I expect. Instead, I just get something that is not really useful for me. But imagine a scenario where I would get on a plane from Gatwick to JFK, and I would just uh, rent a car in there, but not just rent a car, I would basically be given information about before I land, where I could pick it up, it was ready when I just arrived, everything was just working smoothly. 
they would tell me that I needed to pack a bigger coat or a thicker coat. Not necessary when I come to Dubai. I need to pack my shorts and t-shirts instead. <clears throat> Giving me uh, suggestions for restaurants. How many times have you guys found yourself in a foreign city that you don't know and you need to go to eat and you try to figure it out where you want to go and have some decent food? They could do that as well. Why not just ahead of time let me book my entertainment schedule once I get on the plane? So you sit down in the seat with this too small screen, try to figure out what you want to see. They could do all these things and they could do it and if they do so, they would basically create more purpose, they would be more useful and they would get much more information from me and understand me a lot better. So before, the talk before was also, uh, the end was about data. Data is king and context is equal king. So the more data we have and the more we're able to execute on that data, the better experiences we can create. So now it's essentially up to you guys as end users, government entities, CEOs, CIOs, CMOs, and all the other types of customers that are here today to make a choice. Whether your brand will just be continuously focusing on what you might do today, I guess since you're here, you have a notion that things are moving in a slightly different direction, but whether you want to just continue to focus on price, lowering the price, lowering the price, improving your product but still at a lower price, or you want to get to a point where price might not matter that much. We also heard from Nusha that she had had an, a, a rating that apparently just it soured up just because of price. Um, having those kinds of conversations where, where price might become more irrelevant, that's an interesting point to get to. The survey shows that in 2020, price will not be the primary competitor. That will be the customer experience. And from my work in the region, there are so many brands down here that really get this and really understand that and really want to move into a completely different place. But it is a, it's a specific choice that you make. It's not something that just happens overnight. It's a choice. It's a, it's a very conscious choice that you make as a company that you want to go into that direction and that you want to move closer to that inner circle. So maybe a look into the future as well. When... Uh, when we all go exercising, I guess a lot of you, just like myself, carry some sort of wearable. This is an example, f uh, an example situation with Fitbit. How could they actually leverage some of this? So we know that half of us are wearing these wearable device devices. Um, most of them are uh, fitness devices. So a company like Fitbit, what could they do? So instead of just tracking my run, maybe come back to me with some more relevant information about how to recover from a run. How do I do stretches afterwards, if I believe that would be helping me? Coordinate efforts with vendors that Fitbit could figure out that I'm interested in, share data, so that I would know that new shoes had been released that would help me do specific stuff. Maybe I want to not just share my physical information, but my medical uh, information as well. Figuring out from, uh, from how I run with sensors and shoes, whether I pronate, over pronate or not. Basically going through all this would allow a much more seamless integration where data, content, purposeness, and the ability to much better understand the consumers just flows together very beautifully. So this is what could happen if we really try to do this. Few companies across the globe really get this and they really, really, really use this to the full extent. Imagine another scenario <clears throat> where when, when you start running, you start your progress, you again, you share your data. Who wants to share data? We all want to share data if it has a purpose. I guess many of us have tried entering a, a web page or any other kind of information sharing situation where we don't feel that there is any real purpose to it. We are then reluctant to share this data. But if we can see a clear purpose, the tendency is that we just very voluntarily actually share this data. So the more purpose and the more value you can bring back to your consumers, the more likely they are to share data. Stuff like AI and machine learning is just flowing into everything. Cycrus just released a, a big uh, machine learning initiative on our platform, but it is flowing into every part of your daily life. 
smart mirrors coming very soon that will basically help you monitor your health when you get up in the morning, give you all the relevant information straight there when you're there in the, looking in the mirror, making sure that you get out the door in the morning. So a very um, vivid example of how this can be done is the known Nutritia, which is one of our big global clients. Uh, this particular case is coming from the Netherlands. They uh, produce baby formula and they do that for, of course, for toddlers and newborns, but also a bit bigger kids. Um, they went through a huge proce process of basically redefining themselves as a company. They could continue just push baby powder out the door, which was good business, but they wanted to try and basically revamp what they did. So they figured out and found out that most women are not necessarily terrified, but it is a big thing to get a newborn. It changes your world dramatically. So they repurposed their entire business model around a, um, a specific strategy, uh, digital strategy that basically gave them four stages covering the first thousand days of the interaction between baby and mother. And they figured and found that what they were to do was they were to be the company that supplied the mothers with as much relevant information as possible about the de development of their kid, the nutrition of their kid, sicknesses, ailments, and all that, which actually resulted in that 23% of all women in the Netherlands are using that app now to interact with the known nutrition. So <clears throat> it allowed them to not only get 23% of all the women in there, but it allowed them to start to interact in a very um, contextually relevant uh, way in all of their channels because they were now having a clear purpose. They could now create content that fitted into all of these channels and thereby starting to drive everything in a very, very coordinated fashion. So to do this, you need leadership, you need courage, and you need to define a few steps, define your promise, be entrepreneurial, find the content and services that will help, and then basically deliver what is called experience con continuity. So define your promises or your purpose. What kind of company do you want to be? Do you want to be the Teslas that basically introduced electric cars to the world? Or do you want to be Dove that found purpose in making sure that women did not suffer from low self-esteem, etc.? So figure out... <clears throat> what kind of purpose your company has. You need to be entrepreneurial in the way that you try and work with your customers. Make sure that you understand them and help them achieve their goals. You want to make sure that you have the relevant content to cover all these different channels and situations. As you can see, 45% of the respondents in the survey is actually willing to provide data if it helps you personalize their experience. So deliver this experience continuity Experience continuity means I am able to be followed and have the same experience across devices. L'Oreal, another customer of ours, is doing this. Most consultations for beauty starts either online or directly in a consultation with uh, a dermatologist. So all this information goes back to L'Oreal so that the lady, she can continue her journey when she comes home. And it directly translates into L'Oreal's very large universe of brands so that she can now, with the tone of her skin and color of her hair and eyes and everything, can start to figure out what kind of makeup does she need. So this is another story from the real life. So if you want to break into this inner circle, we have the capacity to withhold roughly 150 uh, people in our mind to where we can have meaningful relationships with those. It's a bit different for brands. We hold three to six brands. So your challenge is a lot bigger because there are so few brands that get into this inner circle. So with Cycro and at Cycro, we are helping you guys basically realize the potential. We help you manage your content. We help you get purpose communicated to your customers so that you can actually become one of those brands that will be in the inner circle of your customers and thereby create what we call customers for life. So that was what I had for you guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you.